on the three dots that say more at the bottom of your screen and select subtitles. Just to note, we are recording this meeting and sharing on our YouTube channel and social media. We'll be repeating these housekeeping notes once again, closer to eight o'clock for those who are joining late. Now, do you want to give it a minute till eight? Uh, yes, Andrew, we will. Uh, maybe just a couple more Thanks. minutes. Great. Once again, welcome to United Way Greater Toronto's 2020 AGM. The meeting will begin very shortly at 8 a.m. Members who have already made their vote count by sending us your proxy, thank you. You do not need to vote today. Members who are voting, please log in now to the online voting booth. If you need assistance, you can email corporate secretary at uwgt.org or call Chris at 905-865-6617. If you're not a member, welcome. We're pleased you could join us. The first 30 minutes or so will be governance matters, which will then be followed by a keynote from our CEO, Daniele Zanati, and a panel discussion. We have over 700 people registered, which is a fantastic turnout. But to help us manage communications more smoothly, all participants are muted. If you'd like to contribute to the discussion, please email questions or comments to webinars at uwgt.org. The chat function will also be available to members during the business meeting, and again later for everyone in the Q&A period following the panel discussion. All guests are encouraged to enable their video. We do miss meeting you in person and love would love to see your faces. Closed caption is also available. For those guests who'd like to enable the feature, click on the three dots that say more at the bottom of your screen and select subtitles. A note that we are recording this meeting and we'll be sharing on our YouTube channel and social media. And now it's eight o'clock and please welcome the chair of the Board of Trustees for United Way, Andrew Pickersgill. Thank you, Norman. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the United Way by, by Zoom. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe and recognize most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory was subject of an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in this territory. Thank you to all of us who have joined us today. My name is Andrew Pickersgill, Chair of the Board of Trustees of the United Way of Greater Toronto and I'll chair the business portion of today's program. Today's annual general meeting of members will take place, as you can clearly see, in a virtual only format. Prior to the meeting, members were encouraged to submit a proxy form to the United Way of Greater Toronto. We thank all those members who have submitted a proxy already for making your vote count, and you will not need to participate in our online voting system today. For those of you who have not submitted a proxy in advance, you will be voting through our online system. If you have not already logged into our voting system, this would be a good time to do so, to log in and ensure, <clears throat> excuse me, that all is working appropriately. We're now gonna test the voting booth and ask you to vote on the following test question. Are we ready? The question is, I like the weather where I'm located today. Note, the question and the motions later in the program will not be displayed on the voting system. They will be dis displayed on the Zoom screen you're looking at only. We ask you to please click on the online voting station button to enter the voting booth and to cast your vote. If you're having challenge with this, please email corporate sector secretary at uwgt.org or call Chris at 905-865-6617, who will be standing by to assist. Let me just repeat that. 
if you're having any challenge accessing the online voting station and you did not submit a proxy in advance, email the corporate secretary at uwgt.org or call Chris at 905-865-6617. I'm gonna give you the results in just a moment of this test vote. At the conclusion of the formal meeting of members, we'll move into our feature event with a presentation from our president and CEO, Daniele Zanotti, followed what, what, by what we expect will be a very lively panel discussion with some of our partners and a chance for you to ask questions. We will have much to report on in this meeting, but first I will ask Louise Powell McCarthy from United Way Centre Canada, who will be assisting with the voting today to announce the results of the test vote. Louise, how are we doing? Good, good morning, Andrew. We have 18 in, um, in favor so, and one opposed. So most of you seem to like the weather today. I agree. Uh, it appears we're working. So onward, I'm delighted to welcome all members to our 64th annual general meeting. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to all of our guests joining us today from Peel, Toronto and York region, including our past board and campaign chairs, Mark Forrester, Shirley Hoy, Heather Mason Wood, Carl Oxholm, Catherine Patterson, John Rogers, Colin Sadana, Beth Wilson and Mark Wiseman. Welcome everyone. We're also joined this morning by our solicitors, uh, Dentons. For 64 years, Dentons has been providing us with outstanding and an unwavering pro bono legal service. Beth Wilson, Blair McCready, Mark Mahoney, and Andreas Kloppenberg of Dentons are here with us today. We appreciate your support today and your firm's commitment to us through the many years. Additionally, Beth Wilson, CEO of Dentons Canada, was the chair of our 2019 campaign cabinet. We're delighted that Beth will join us later in the program. And Blair also co-chaired Leadership Giving, and we're grateful to have their leadership and energy guide us through our campaign. Thank you to Dentons. Let us now turn to the business of the annual general meeting. In order to make this process smoother, certain trustees of United Way Greater Toronto have already identified to me the motions they will either move or second as we go through this. Then we will open the floor to voting members for questions and discussion prior to official votes being called. Any member who wishes to ask questions, please use the chat feature in Zoom, and we'll call upon you in turn. I appoint Anita Stelling, the secretary of the meeting. If no one objects, I appoint Louise Powell McCarthy from United Way Centre Canada to act as scrutineer at this meeting. As well, Paul Totten from United Way Centre Canada will assist with the voting booth. Thank you for lending us your expertise today, Louise and Paul. The meeting is now officially called to order. The scrutiny reports that a quorum of members is present. In addition to the voting members here today, we have received signed proxy from 137 members, appointing myself to vote on their behalf. The secretary has furnished me with proof of publication of the notice calling this meeting, which I direct to be annexed to the minutes of this meeting. Does anyone wish to have this notice read? Please type yes in the chat box if you would like to read the notice of this meeting. Louise, I can't see the chat. There are no, there are no questions. Okay, seeing no requests, I hereby dispense with the reading of the notice. The minutes from the 2019 special and annual general meeting have been distributed to members in their package. Uh, uh, if there are any, uh, again, we'll just ask if there's any discussions to be had of the minutes. Please type yes in the chat box if you'd like to comment so that I know to give you some time to enter your comment. There are no questions. Seeing no discussion, I declare that the minutes from the 2019 special and annual general meeting are hereby adopted. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, it's my pleasure now to share some of the highlights of the United Way's remarkable work over the past year. Bruce McQuaig, the Board's Treasurer, will follow me to provide a financial update. This past year has been one of unprecedented challenges for our community and for the United Way of Greater Toronto. We have faced continued pressures on our historical fundraising model, are navigating a pandemic that preys on the most vulnerable, and are reminded in the past few weeks of the heavy work that still lies ahead to achieve equal opportunities and racial justice for all. Despite these many headwinds, the United Way board and staff remain steadfast in their commitment their commitment to our mission to mobilize knowledge, funds, and people like you to meet the needs of communities impacted by poverty 
across Peel, Toronto, and York region. I'd like to express my gratitude and quite frankly, my immense pride in the way the United Way has risen to this occasion in the past year. And much of that is thanks to so many of you who work and support our organization. In the past year, we have continued to be a leading contributor in community impact, tackling the root causes of poverty through our research and network of agency partners. We have taken necessary steps to build financial resilience, making the difficult but necessary decision to take on an intentional deficit this year with the path to, path to balance our budget by fiscal year 22-23. This helps sustain the United Way's ability to support the most vulnerable across the GTA through our investments. Our path out of this planned deficit is now working. We had a smaller deficit this year than we had forecasted. Finally, the board and management team have been hard at work drawing an organizational blueprint for a United Way of the future, one that has the resources, the resilience, the responsiveness, and the relationships to lead the fight against local poverty. These highlights have all been done in a backdrop of a pandemic that has impacted all of us, our work, our families, our communities. Our United Way is not immune. A little later in this program, Danielle will try and unpack how the pandemic has changed our work. But before that, let me highlight some of the planning and some of the decisions we took in the past year to set the United Way up to meet these unprecedented needs in our communities. Before describing our five priorities of the past year and comment with some examples, um, I feel the need to, to acknowledge the recent events that started in Minneapolis and spread across the world and right here in our own communities. This movement highlighting anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism has strengthened our resolve to listen to our Black and Indigenous colleagues, partners, and network of agencies. So we continue to learn, take action, and work together to address the destructive elements of systemic racism. As a board, we prioritized outreach to people from different walks of life and lived experiences to ensure that our governance structures, our investments, and our public policy are reflecting the community we live in. We have much more to do, but it's also important to highlight where we stand today. Women make up 80, almost 80% 80 of our staff and half the number of volunteers on our board and our committees. Over a third of our board and our committee members are identified as racialized, with 43% of staff identifying so as well. That said, um, I will now summarize five of our major priorities of the past year and give you some examples of the breach. Our first priority was to continue our transformation from a center of excellence in workplace fundraising to a center of excellence in philanthropy, from workplace to philanthropy. This evolution has taken an immense amount of work in the past year. We've had to rapidly innovate in workplace fundraising, which as most of you know is our historical area of strength and begun to engage more digitally and more directly with many donors while broadening our fundraising out, outside the workplace model. The result of this really important transition has been a quite remarkable and highly successful campaign. This past year's campaign rallied more people in the GTA than ever before. As mentioned, it was led by Beth Wilson, president and CEO of Dentons, with CIBC's Laura DeTori Atanasio as our major giving chair. The campaign included a million dollar challenge gift from Alice and Grant Burton. It included numerous new impact fund and digital campaigns. And it had more partners using our Salesforce philanthropy cloud platform for year round fundraising, all resulting in stable funding year over year to our network of agencies, despite a very challenging external context. That was our first priority. Second was to continue to work with our network of agencies to build cross sectoral solutions for our community. As you all know, we have a 15 year legacy of the United Way's Building Strong Neighborhood Strategy that has routinely and consistently engaged corporate, municipal, and community partners in new ways. In the past year, we've innovated again on this dimension uh, and look for new solutions to, to, um, to improve our communities. One example has been our inclusive local economic opportunity work, also known as by the acronym ILIO. ILIO was created when the Bank of Montreal, the City of Toronto, and 24 corporate and community partners came together to forge a new alliance on local job creation, business ownership, and neighborhood development, specifically to revitalize the greater Golden Mile in Scarborough. We think this kind of partnership is indicative of the future and are very proud of some of the progress in the past year on this. Third priority is to drive further engagement as a tool for change. 
In the past year, we engaged our network of United Ways across Ontario to work together on advocating for a robust provincial poverty reduction strategy. We led a team of 17 Ontario-based United Ways in a roundtable discussion with Todd Smith, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. We came together again as a provincial coalition of United Ways during the pandemic, calling on the provincial government to ensure meaningful income security for the most vulnerable, resulting in a lower provincial clawback on the federal Canadian emergency response benefit than in some other provinces. Fourth, we continue to use insights and data to drive our enterprise-wide decisions. There are many examples of this. One we thought we'd highlight is our priority from the last year um, in the United Way's latest research on rebalancing the opportunity equation. This research, which some of you have seen, unpacked the growing income gap and its negative impact on access to opportunity in the GTA. The findings, which received good media coverage, paint an alarming picture for young adults, immigrants, and racialized people. The very same groups are at the greatest risk of falling deeper into our crisis now. This kind of evidence base continues to inform all our work and how we make investments for gaps and needs across the GTA. And finally, turning outward, we focused on being present with communities across Peel, Toronto, and York to reflect the very diverse needs and experiences across our regional footprint. As we kicked off our annual campaign last year, September 17th was officially declared Share Your Local Love Day in eight municipalities across our region. The city of Mississauga lit up its clock tower in our hashtag on ignorable color. And York Region, Peel Region, and City of Toronto all recognized and championed United Way's work, a testament to the amazing support and close partnerships United Way is enjoying with labor and the public sector. Last year alone, over 400,000 people mobilized and supported the United Way to show their local love. And we are well on our way to our aspiration of engaging 1 million people by the year 2025. There are many more examples. I encourage you to read the annual report for more on, what is, on how and how we have remained steadfast to scale local innovations investments regionally while staying present locally. Building this collaboration of care across Peel, Toronto, and York region is more important than ever before. And as I said, Daniele will have more to share on this, the pandemic and our future outlook um, when he gets together at the end of the meeting. For now, I invite Bruce McClain to provide an update on behalf of the Finance, Audit, and Risk Committee. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning to present the final re financial results for the year ended March 31st, 2020, and discuss the health of our financial position, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic period, which brings us strong along financial uncertainties in all sectors, the private, the public, and the not-for-profit sectors. United Way has a strong and independent finance, audit, and risk committee comprised of eight members, and I would like to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to them for their outstanding support and commitment. The financial statements consolidate the financial results of the United Way's operations, capital expenditures, and the Tomorrow Fund. They are prepared in accordance with Canadian accounting standards for not-for-profits. The committee oversees the United Way's audit, budgets, investments, pension and benefits, and risk management on behalf of the Board of Trustees. Auditing standards do require that management undertake a going concern assessment on an annual basis, especially with all the financial uncertainties as a result of COVID-19. KPMG concurred that the organization met the requirements of being a going concern for this fiscal year. Factors, amongst others that were reviewed, include positive and negative financial indicators, ability to access government stimulus and emergency programs, financial reserve levels, and other funding sources accessible to sustain operations. United Way is committed to its community investments across Peel, Toronto, and York Region. The Board of Trustees and management will be doing everything that can be done to maintain the financial commitments to its network of agencies and community partners for as long as possible. Some of the measures being taken to maintain our financial commitments include launching the campaign season now, reviewing our own operations, and digging deep in the financial reserve to minimize impact to agencies and community partners. 
United Way management has contingency plans that can be readily deployed should financial circumstances require the organization to take additional corrective actions to preserve its immediate financial health and long-term sustainability. Here are some financial highlights for the past fiscal year. First, revenues were $132.2 million for fiscal year 1920, with United Way processing and distributing $32 million to other registered charities. Second, at $90 million this year, community investments continue to be supported through generous donations and the recognition that United Way is the best place to invest in our communities. The level of investment is on par with the previous year. Third, the operating deficit was $9.9 .9 million, and it included an unrealized investment loss of $4.1 million in the Tomorrow Fund investment portfolio. When normalized, this operating deficit is comparable to last year's. Fourth, United Way's fundraising cost revenue ratio continues to remain low by industry standards at 16.3%. Management continues to maintain a strong focus on operational efficiency, and this diligence is reflected in the fundraising cost revenue ratio. I would like to report that the auditors and the members of the Finance, Audit, and Risk Committee are satisfied with the strength of the administrative and financial management systems and the systems of internal controls in place at the United Way. I'd like to draw your attention to the independent auditor's report in the audited financial statements issued by a KPMG LLP. A summary of the report is encompassed in three points. First, uncorrected differences were identified by KPMG, but these are not material to the financial statements. Second, the the conclusion that the United Way is a going concern in this COVID-19 pandemic environment. And third, an unqualified clean audit. Both the Board of Trustees and management believe strongly in financial transparency so that the operations of the organization are clear and understandable to our donors and all other stakeholders. I would like to now move the following resolution. Be it resolved that KPMG LLP is hereby appointed auditor of the corporation to hold office until the next annual general meeting of members at such remuneration as may be fixed by the directors, and the directors are hereby authorized to fix such remuneration. James Meadows has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion on this matter? Please type yes in the chat box if you would like to comment. There are no comments. Thank you, Anita. Are there any further nominations? Please type yes in the chat box if you would like to propose a nominee. And uh, just a moment, Bruce, I see a comment in the chat box from um, a participant, Alka Verma. Is there a question that you had? Are you still, Alka, I see your chat that you are having trouble hearing something. So one of our staff people will be in touch with you in regards to um, your audio. Was that the nature of your question, Alka? Bruce, I suggest that you continue, please. Okay, thank you, Anita. Okay, see that there are no other nominations. Voting members are now invited to cast their vote at the voting booth. You will have one minute to submit your vote. After the time has passed, the voting booth, booth will close. So I'm gonna to pause to allow people to vote.
Mr. Treasurer, voting has been closed and here are the results. There are 165 votes in favor, no votes not in favor, and no abstentions. Thank you very much, Louise. I declare the resolution carried. And now I pass the meeting back to Andrew. Thank you. Bruce, thank you for your dedication in leading our Finance Audit and Risk Committee this year and overseeing our finances. I would now like to present the report from our Governance and Human Resources Committee. This committee is responsible for ensuring the continued excellence of governance at the United Way Greater Toronto by doing three things. First, recruiting and developing a stable and effective volunteer leadership to the board and its committees. Second, shaping the board's governance model to meet the evolving needs of the organization. And third, ensuring excellence in the management of the organization through reviewing the objectives and the performance of our CEO and ensuring the CEO is appropriately supported at the executive level. The Governance and Human Resources Committee is chaired by myself and the other members include Lisa Gonzalez, Bruce McCaig, Patricia Ocampo, and Jameson Stevie. The Governance and Human Resources Committee has been working hard this year to identify changes we need to, make the to meet the governance needs of our organization and has provided our nominations report, which has been circulated to members. This year, we have two trustees who will be stepping off the board at, as of this AGM, Kwame McKenzie and Andrew Robertson. We have two trustees who were filling vacancies whose terms are ending, and the committee is nominating them for a new three-year term. That includes Betsy Chung and Mark Wiseman. We also have two trustees whose terms are ending, and the committee is nominating for another three-year term, Patricia Ocampo, Jameson Stevie. Lastly, the Governance and Human Resources Committee is nominating one new individual to join our board, Isla McGlynn. Now let me introduce you to the nominees for the board. Members will find their full bios for each of the candidates in the nominations report, which I'd encourage you to take a look at. But I'd, give, I'd like to give you a few highlights for each person. Betsy Chung joined our board to fill a vacancy in 2018. She's also a valuable member of our Strategic Resource Development Committee. Betsy has over 25 years of experience in the financial services industry, leading large global teams driving marketing strategies. Most recently, Betsy is the Canadian Chief Marketing Officer, a key member of the executive leadership and a key member of the executive leadership team for TD's Canadian businesses. Isla McGlynn is a dedicated United Way supporter, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and volunteer. She was active with the United Way Halifax and is now a member of our major individual giving cabinet. Isla began her career at Scotiabank in 1989, and currently she is Senior Vice President of Executive Support, which includes the leadership and oversight of specific philanthropic commitments and special projects across Scotia. Mark Wiseman is a longtime friend to the United Way Greater Toronto. He chaired our campaign cabinet in 2015. He's been a member of our major individual giving cabinet since 2009, and he joined our board to fill a vacancy in 2018. Mark is a Canadian investment manager and business executive and an industry leading expert in alternatives and active equity investments. Among his advisory roles with various organizations, Mark serves as a part-time senior advisor to Hill House Capital. During these unprecedented times of change and crisis, we are grateful that two trustees have agreed to stand for another term to provide stability. Dr. Patricia Ocampo has served as a member of our Community Impact Committee since 2010, and she currently chairs the, that committee. Pat has been a valuable member of our board since 2011. Pat is the Interim Executive Director at Lee Cushing Knowledge Institute, and she is an internationally renowned public health scholar, focusing her research on understanding the health impacts of complex urban social problems experienced by low-income populations. Jameson Stevie began volunteering for our Education to Employment Task Force in 2013, and he joined our board formally in 2014. Since then, Jameson has served on three of our four governance committees and currently chairs our Strategic Resource Development Committee. Jameson is a senior advisor to uh, Jillian Hatfield at the new Schwartz-Reisman Institute for Technology and Society. He also teaches public policy at both the University of Toronto and at McGill University. Previously, Jameson held a number of high level roles in the provincial government, including health policy advisor to the Premier Donald, Donald McGintney, chief of staff to the Minister of Health and principal secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the slate of our board of nominees that we ask you to elect. On behalf of the Governance and Human Resources Committee, I will move the motion. Be it resolved that Betsy Chung, Isla McGlynn, Patricia Ocampo, 
Jameson Steve, and Mark Wiseman be elected to the Board of Trustees of the Corporation for a three-year term. Lisa Gonzalez has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion on this matter? If so, please type yes in your chat box if you'd like to comment. There are no comments. Are there any further nominations? If so, again, please type yes, yes in the chat box if you'd like to propose a nominee. There are no further nominations. It's going very smooth. Thank you, Anita. Seeing none, I declare the nominations closed. Voting members are now invited to cast your vote at the voting booth. You will have, you will have one minute to submit your vote, so I will be quiet. After the time has passed, the voting booth will close. Mr. Chair, voting has closed and here are the results. 166 in favor, zero not in favor, zero abstentions. Thank you, Louise. I declare the resolution carried. Thank you to Betsy, Pat, Jameson and Mark for your continued commitment to the board and to Isla for joining our board and continuing to lend your experience and wisdom to the United Way. I'd also like to let you know that another volunteer has recently been appointed to our board. Cheryl Craig's bio has, has been included in the members package <clears throat> and we're delighted to introduce her now. Earlier this year, Andrew Robertson submitted his resignation from the board due to personal reasons. Pursuant to our bylaws, when a vacancy on the board occurs, the remaining trustees may appoint a replacement for the remainder of the term. The board appointed Cheryl Craig to fill Andrew's term, which will end at the AGM in 2021. Cheryl Craig is the president of the Peel Regional Labor Council and represents workers in Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon. Her role as a crane operator at Hydro Extrusion Canada includes a membership on the United Steelworkers Union. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. That brings us to the end of the formal business portion of this year's annual general meeting. Is there any other business to be proposed? If you have some, please type yes in the chat box if you'd like to propose any item. There are no further comments. Thanks, Anita. There being no other business raised, I hereby declare that this year's annual general meeting of members is hereby terminated. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the formal business of this year's annual general meeting. Now I have the pleasure to recognize two trustees who are retiring from our board, but who we know will, re will remain committed supporters of our mission. Andrew Robertson was recently the first vice president at the Peel Regional Labor Council. Since 2005, he's been a teacher and a guidance counselor, counselor at St. Thomas Aquinas Secondary School within the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. Andrew joined the United Way of Peel Regional Board of Directors in 2015, representing Peel Regional Labor Council. In 2018, he joined the United Way Greater Toronto Board following our merger with the United Way of Peel Region and has served as a member of our Community Impact Committee. Over his ten tenure, Andrew has been a passionate advocate for those that are vulnerable in our community. We're grateful for his support and we'll miss his unwavering passion for social, ju social justice. Thank you to Andrew. Next, I'd like to recognize Dr. Kwan McKenzie, who is the Chief Executive Officer at the Wellesley Institute. He's also the Director of Clinical Health Equity at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Kwan has been a trustee of our board and a member of our Community Impact Committee since 2013. Kwam is an international expert on the social causes of illness, suicide, and the development of effective equitable health systems. In addition to the aforementioned roles, he also serves as a commissioner on the Ontario Human Rights Commission, 
a member of the National Advisory Council on Poverty, and, he's a and he is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. We have known Quam to be a dignified thought leader on the social determinants of health. He is a leader of stature and a community champion for equity. We have deeply benefited from Quam's questioning of conventional thinking, which he does with insight, humor, and the weight of evidence. Thank you to Quam for years of dedication and service and for all you have added to the United Way's work. So to take you over to the rest of today's program, I'd like to welcome the United Way of Greater Toronto's president and CEO, Daniel Zanotti. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome all. This is not a president's AGM speech. I have delivered 13 of those from United Way podiums in York Region and the Greater Toronto area. Looks back, looks forward, lists of achievements, plans. This is not a portrait of the characters in the Zanadi clan. Uncle Frank's Zabalione breakfast, my shoemaker Nonno's soul stories, my ma's plastic couch, or my pa's tomato garden. This is not a poem, though three words do indeed rhyme. This is a plea, first whispered over the phone to me, days into the COVID-19 state of emergency. Now, blame it on working from home alone too much too long. Blame it on walking alone too much too long. Blame it on this piling of pandemics, COVID, systemic racism, income inequality. When we are realizing again, as if for the first time, as MLK penned, quote, we are an inescapable network of mutuality. That injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, end of quote. This is a plea I dare share of what this place we love needs to be great for all. These words George whispered when he called to thank you days after our care found him. He said, we need a united way, lowercase, spilling with emotion, motion, commotion. And he said it just like that, lowercase, spilling with emotion, motion, commotion in one breath with no pause, like it was wild and reckless, all one word. Almost 90 days since that whisper. And thanks to you, more than an organization with meetings, minutes, motions, more than the biggest United Way in the world, largest investor in social services next to government, and we are all that. We are emotion. A United Way spilling over with emails, voicemails, texts, tweets, whispers, webinars, words like here, help, now, how, want, please. Connecting raw, real, right now care to the streets and towers and suburbs. Follow this. A volunteer from a United Way agency knocks on a door on the 27th floor in a Toronto community housing building just hours after a senior called in to a national radio show. No food in his fridge for a week. The host in Vancouver calls a City of Toronto employee working at a United Way cluster table, who calls United Way funded 211, who sends this volunteer. And our care found George. That's right, George, the plea whisperer. An outreach worker walks kilometers to a ravine in Newmarket to tell a homeless man deep down asleep under the trees that meals were starting again on Monday. 
A domestic violence counselor watches a row of apartments in Mississauga from her car for hours to see if any white towels are folded on the balcony. COVID code for I need help now. Leveraging this, your palpable passion to help and care and propel motion, motion, the fastest route to getting our help to the most vulnerable. No time for reams of reports, theories of change, just decades of deep on the ground connections, finding, funding, big, small, impactful, all grassroots groups closest to the problems and the solutions. We were the first to offer our 270 frontline agencies flexible funding. So our $7.5 million monthly investment to community is in the trusted hands of our agencies, allowing them to go where the need is greatest, provide care in new ways. United Way partnering with the City of Toronto, Region of York, and Peel, connecting their emergency response centers with communities, co-chairing cluster tables in neighborhoods across the six, community action tables in the 905, and every day, our 400 plus grassroots agencies meeting virtually to identify problems and solve together. We rolled out our local love emergency fund in March to get resources out the door and on the ground in record time. Well over 2 million United Way emergency dollars invested to date in 200 hyper-local projects bridging critical gaps in services. And United Way there, when the federal government needed a trusted community partner to get short-term emergency funds to the people and places that needed them the most. Investing 850,000 of the New Horizons for Seniors Fund in the GTA with 51 community initi initiatives already on the ground at work in neighborhoods as we speak. $2.8 million through Canada's reaching home to address homelessness in York Region. And last week, we rolled out the Federal Community Emergency Response Fund, $11 million for the GTA. Decisions, dollars out on the ground by end of July. And we're doing that in partnership with the Toronto Foundation, Mississauga Community Foundation, and Red Cross to maximize our impact. And across all our emergency response COVID investments, including both United Way and leveraged federal funds, close to 90% of funded agencies are supporting equity-seeking groups including Black and Indigenous populations. This emotion, this uprising of care, driving motion and embracing commotion. Others are developing products, strategies, funding streams focused on one issue. As we stand stubbornly alone, supporting and strengthening this network of frontline agencies in neighborhoods. It's hell to explain, unsexy to sell, messy to manage, and still the most orderly commotion to drive immediate and systemic change. Research shows decade after decade that connected communities with agencies, volunteers, associations, businesses, labor, faith, all working together, connected communities are more resilient. Our network, critical in normal times to ensure people get the help they need, how, when, where they need it. Now, this network of agencies, hundreds of thousands of frontline staff and volunteers you support, essential. Because in times of crisis, Chicago heat waves, 911, 
Canada wildfires. Research also shows that expanding that network, welcoming more local grassroots partners actually strengthens the immediate response and a community's ability to recover long term. We built on commotion, opened our emergency RFP, and to date, over one third of the agencies receiving rapid response COVID funding are completely new to United Way, helping propel our care to the most vulnerable. In a year when our comms people really wanted me to hit all the key messages and proof points. In a year when you maybe wanted me to retell the tale of my uncle Frank and I, stealing the St. Anthony figurine full of holy water from my mom's nightstand for my grade one show and tell class and me winning by sprinkling the St. Anthony holy water on the whole class. I offer you George's whispered plea because we are knee deep in our community's greatest crises in living memory because the fault lines of poverty lay bare for all of us to see because prejudice and privilege is preventing too many from being treated with the humanity that they, that we all deserve. Because people are hungry, yearning, mobilizing for societal change to be part of a united way, lowercase, spilling with emotion, motion, commotion. And thanks to you, each and every one of you, donors, volunteers, frontline agencies, corporate, community, and labor partners, each of you, this united way today, now, stands stronger with and in solidarity with community to show and tell how we are breathing life into this plea, always seeking new ways to give space for the emotion, motion, commotion of new voices and leadership. I'd like to introduce today's panelists, each servant leaders, each modeling the courage, the humility to embrace change and ensure that a region is great only if it's great for all. And each familiar United Way faces to so many of you. The Honorable Ahmed Hussein, Minister of Families, Children and Social Development and MP for York Southwestern. Toyo Ajibolade, Executive Director, Lady Ballers Camp. And Beth Wilson, CEO of Dentons Canada, and as noted earlier, our 2019 campaign cabinet chair. Each and every one of you, questions, please send them through to webinars at uwgt.org. And at the end of the discussion, we'll also open the chat feature so we can answer some of the questions during our Q and A even if we don't have time for all. Welcome, Minister. Your government responded quickly, Minister, to the pandemic with significant dollars. Your government chose United Way as a trusted partner to get resources into the hands of community. Tell us, Minister Hussein, why it was important to quickly and clearly prioritize seniors, those vulnerable to homeless, 
and other groups for the Emergency Community Support Fund. Thank you so much uh, for welcoming me to this panel discussion with the United Way Greater Toronto. Uh, we moved very, very quickly during the pandemic uh, with significant dollars, and we chose United Way as a trusted partner to get resources into the hands of communities quickly. As you know, seniors are the most vulnerable uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the current situation brings terrible economic stress and anxiety to seniors. And so to protect the financial security of seniors during this uh, difficult time, uh, we provided uh, seniors the, the, the option of being eligible for the Canada Emergency Response benefit for those seniors who have stopped working because of COVID-19, uh, either because their job has disappeared or they've been laid off, or they, 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 their job is available, but they have, uh, they have stopped working so that they can take care of uh, a loved one. That also allows any senior who has to stop working to take care of a loved one because of COVID-19 uh, situations to be eligible for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. We also uh, allowed seniors to collect the CERB even if they receive the Canada Pension Plan or Old Age Security or the Guaranteed Income Supplement without interruption to these benefits. Canadian seniors have already received a special top-up payment through the GST tax credit. More than 4 million low and modest income seniors have benefited from this top-up, receiving a total of $1.3 billion in financial support with an average of about $375 for single seniors and $510 for senior couples. Uh, seniors who are eligible for the, uh, for the old age security as well as the uh, GIS are also receiving uh, top-up payments, one-time top-up payments. Uh, the, for those who are receiving the old age security, they're receiving a one-time tax-free payment of $300. For those who are eligible for the guaranteed income supplement, they'll receive an additional $200 for a total of $500. Uh, this will really help uh, many, many seniors to, to receive a little bit more financial assistance during this pandemic. And uh, we also provided $20 million more uh, through the new, new Horizons for Seniors program, uh, $9 million for local organizations through United Way Canada. Uh, we have invested, as you've already indicated, $350 million in the new Emergency Community Support Fund that will help all vulnerable Canadians, including seniors in need. Um, given the opportunity to New Horizons for Seniors program recipients to use their funding to help seniors during this pandemic and to be flexible in the deployment of those uh, of those dollars for those who are experiencing homelessness we have we moved really really quickly to provide an additional 157.5 million dollars uh, to 51 community entities to respond quickly to prevent uh, outbreaks of covid-19 pandemic uh, in the homeless population and to contain any potential outbreaks we also provided an additional $50 million uh, directly to women's shelters. That is a total of $207.5 million. And that is why, because we moved early and because we moved quickly, and we've also made that funding flexible to those community entities. We've told them, use it in whichever way that you feel is important to fight COVID-19 on the ground uh, when it comes to the homeless population, whether it is getting more space more cleaning supplies, getting uh, physical distancing materials uh, and, and, and personal protective equipment. So that is why uh, you don't hear uh, long and sustained outbreaks of COVID-19 among the homeless population in the same way that you hear uh, about uh, seniors in long-term care facilities. So I strongly believe that the federal dollars that we provided uh, to those entities early and quickly made a huge difference uh, to, to, to the organizations. And I want to thank uh, United Way, Centraid Canada uh, for being a partner also in the response to homelessness uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. As you think, Minister, about your York Southwest and riding, 
you, your purview across all of the country. How has the partnership with United Way uh, helped the government best meet the needs of our most vulnerable, especially in the GTA? Thank you. That's a really, really important question. Because we, we, we were dealing with a pandemic, because people need help now, uh, because there is no time uh, to waste, uh, we decided to go through United Way to disperse these funds. Uh, the reason is because if we decided to disperse the funds directly from the government, it would have taken us at least a few months because of the way the government uh, moves slower. But by going through a trusted national uh, organization that has huge networks and community trust like United Way, we were able to get that money out much faster into the community. So uh, we, looked, we looked to United Way's trusted network to help us to get to the community, to get to the most vulnerable. Uh, United Way Greater Toronto uh, is administering $850,000 in funding from, the, from our government's uh, New Horizons for Seniors program. So this is the GTA portion of the $9 million in funding that the government of Canada has announced at the end of March and that United Way uh, is, dis uh, is distributing to 51 organizations across the Greater Toronto area. United Way Greater Toronto is also helping the government of Canada to administer the Peel, Toronto and York allo allotment of $11 million uh, from the federal government's Emergency Community Support Fund. And I really wanna thank United Way for being a great partner to us. Uh, United Way Greater Toronto is also administering over $3 million in emergency COVID-19 funding under the federal anti-homelessness program called Reaching Home for a range of programs, including those that support women and, ch and children seeking shelter and those sleeping uh, on the street. So great partnership, uh, helping us to move really quickly to reach the most vulnerable. Thank you so much once again. Well, Minister, thank you for the leadership. Your a few key words you said that give hope, but also are a testament to your leadership at the cabinet table and your vision of getting out quickly and clearly. The federal funding commitment to flexibility, so key for our frontline agencies yes. to be able to invest where they need it. And thank you for that the quickest direct line to get to the most vulnerable, recognizing that there are things that government can do and can do exceptionally well. There are things that only community can do yes. and do exceptionally well. And then this concept you said of this network of agencies, which for us is our mission. It is our stubborn belief that we are better together and wrap around support as important as food is, as important as mental health programs are, it is impossible to separate a child from uh, needing food to a mom who may also be experiencing stress because of financial impact. And this package that you've created quickly and clearly has been not only unprecedented, but maximizes impact because it gives community a chance to respond. I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, Minister, on a more personal note. Um, heartened by a story you shared as your experience growing up as a black immigrant in Regent Park, a community of focus for our work, as you know. Yes. A, a few moments, Minister, if you could. What that experience has meant to you as a man, a dad, a minister, and what it's meant to your work, especially in these times. So uh, thank you so much. That, I mean, look, I, I think that we all are informed by our experiences and we bring them uh, wherever we go. Uh, one of the reasons I actually got involved in politics and public life is that uh, is the experience that I had in Regent Park. This was a community that was overlooked by everyone. Um, and, you know, 
there were people from 65 different uh, uh, nationalities uh, or, or uh, national origins. Uh, people from all over the world made region park their home so in many ways region park was the was the microcosm of canada but we were completely overlooked and we had virtually no community services uh, in region park and you know there was no let me let me use a really graphic example something as simple that we take for granted as a mailbox there was no, there was not even a single mailbox in Regent Park at the time. Now it's much better. So in other words, as a young man, for me to mail a resume to get a job, I had to leave my community of 20,000 people in order to mail that letter because we didn't have a mailbox, let alone other community services. So one of the reasons I, I got involved in politics is because the residents of Regent Park took me under their wing and we uh, organized effectively. We met for eight weekends in a church basement to organize our voice because we had numbers and we had a voice that we wanted to, to, to share with the rest of the world about who we, who we were and what our aspirations were. And we organized ourselves and we started holding the institutions that were in our midst accountable. And things started to improve and young people started getting jobs and the environment was improved and we we contributed to the revitalization plan the 500 million dollars that we were able to get to revitalize not only the buildings but also the people and we had so much success and that is when i realized that public service and politics can be a force for good that you can make a difference in 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 people's lives and in communities uh, and it, it, is, it is why I ran for office, because I realized the importance of community services to enable people to succeed. Exactly what United Way, a greater Toronto area, provides for people. You provide much needed services that people use to succeed. And then other people come and then they use those services to succeed. And the people who succeeded using your services donate to United Way to enable others to succeed. That's what being in community is about. And you provide that, that, uh, that vehicle for people to, to donate and to get involved. And so I ran for office to preserve those services and expand them for the next generation because I knew how much those services helped me. Uh, for example, I didn't have a printer at home. So I had to go to the community library to print my first resume. Now, if there was no library, I wouldn't be able to do that. So federal social tools and funding that we're giving to communities makes all the difference in the world in the lives of Canadian families. The Canada Child Benefit has lifted hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty. Uh, in some provinces, the Canada Child Benefit has, lif has, uh, has lifted half of the children out of poverty, 50% has reduced child poverty by 50%. Now that means there's 50% more work to be done, but 50% progress in four years is, is, is quite an achievement. Um, this pandemic has shown that those who were already vulnerable are suffering more than the others. And so we have, in my ministry and beyond uh, in our government, we have focused on those uh, on those most vulnerable people in our community including children and i'm sure that you will you will agree with me when i say that canada's strength lies in its diversity uh, especially in difficult times when we have to rely on each other when we have to come together to really emerge stronger out of this pandemic part of advancing this diversity is supporting uh, marginalized communities black and indigenous and racialized community organizations who play such an important role uh, in providing crucial services uh, to Canadian communities and who are partners in the United Way network. Uh, so the government is investing an additional $25 million over five years for capital assistance and capacity building for Black-led community organizations because these community organizations serving Black Canadians uh, have been complaining for decades that what they need is 
to for us to help them build the capacity so that they can compete uh, on a bigger scale and they can provide even more services to those uh, who are in need in their community. So we will be opening a call for proposals to fund capital projects in the black community very soon. Our government is also working really, really hard on social inclusion issues and taking this time to respond to the need of Canadians whose consciousness has been raised up uh, on, an, uh, on issues around equity and inclusion and fighting systemic discrimination and racism. So we will be your partner in uh, moving ahead in making sure that uh, we, we are always keeping our focus on vulnerable Canadians by partnering with trusted, trusted, trusted organizations like the United Way of Greater Toronto Area. Thank you so much, merci beaucoup. Such an honor, Minister. That, that visual of a mailbox the emotion of a group of people getting together to act in a church basement over weekends to get you to get others to places of opportunity that cannot be singular or exception that has got to be the norm for every young person black yes. indigenous um, and thank you for being part not only speaking to that, having the courage to talk about your personal, what it means for you, uh, for being member of the Black Members Caucus at the national level, talking about disaggregating data, changes yeah. to the criminal and justice system, all important things that we have got to focus on. Thank you for that. From you, Minister, to Toil. Toil, Executive Director, of the Lady Ballers Club. Tell us a little bit about the Lady Ballers Club and then the youth you are working with, Toyo, and some of the challenges they're facing. Welcome, friend. Hi. Um, so thank you so much, first of all, for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure to join everyone on this platform. At Lady Ballers Camp, we strive to provide programming, uh, recreational activities, learning and leadership opportunities for youth and young girls from racialized and underserved communities. So for black youth, the impact that COVID is having on their lives is so very multi-layered. We see how the pandemic is intensifying pre-existing issues facing our youth while creating new ones. Anti-black racism being declared a public health crisis is re uh, recently speaks volumes to this. Black youth are facing um, a double pandemic as it is a crisis within a crisis, right? Um, so what puts them at a greater risk is uh, what we find is that often their parents are the ones working on the front lines as essential workers um, living in under-resourced neighborhoods and substandard densely populated um, housing. You know, a lot of our participants live in small apartment buildings, small apartment units with um, multiple children and adults relying on public transit, food insecurity, um, and just in inequities in um, healthcare provision. So on the ground, we see just overall elevated levels of um, anxiety, loneliness, and um, yeah, just overall just depression, right? Um, the youth living in shelters are facing more social, socially isolated and uncertainty about their futures than ever before. Um, many living in the public housing are, are feeling very overwhelmed, uh, cramped in their tiny apartments. There are many family conflicts and tensions, you know, run high with parents facing job losses uh, or experiencing burnout, overlooked in high-risk environments. There are greater financial strains for everyone, but especially them, and food insecurities than ever before. So many of these pressures coming together um, within these families are being downloaded onto our young people, uh, many of which from our um, programs, especially for our female youth, um, as they're having to step up on running the household while their parents are working around the clock, looking after their siblings and cousins. And um, this is really exemplified, you know, one of, one of the 13-year-old um, girls that um, I've been regularly checking in on, um, she has always been an active participant in our programs, coming to every single program, taking on a leadership role. Uh, she expressed to me that throughout this period, um, she has not been able to sleep well and was essentially, you know, struggling with insomnia. Um, beyond just being sh um, stressed, stretched thin um, from looking after her three younger siblings, 
um, day in and day out, she's also been trying to keep up with school online, which is, you know, it's pretty new for everyone else. Um, but what most keeps her up at night is constantly, uh, constantly worrying about her mom, a personal support worker who has her own self, her whole, her own set of uh, health issues, uh, potentially contracting the virus. Um, what we have seen, uh, we have seen how just shift in school online has generated a lot of stress in general and anxiety for children and youth. But beyond the, div the digital divide in education, uh, with many not having access to access or uh, limited access to a computer and internet, um, the experience for Black children and youth is um, much more profound. So even pre-COVID, they were already feeling isolated and alienated, given the anti-Black racism that is uh, they they have continuously had to endure with. You know, this is something that we talked to uh, our participants about uh, within the school system. A lot of them have reported. Uh, a lot of which has been reported now even um, on CBC and other networks. Uh, we've had participants speak on how overall um, low expectations from their teachers, guidance counselors, uh, race-based treatment practices where uh, Black students are encouraged in, into lower level courses, you know, higher rates of suspension, expulsion, hyper surveillance. Um, now that this, uh, now this pandemic itself has created you know, um, a deeper chasm of disconnection and um, it's even more amplified by this bleak existential look of future uncertainty. What is their school life now going to be? At, not, what is it going to look like now after this pandemic, um, after all these reports have come out and um, the true depth of um, anti-Black racism um, is being uncovered? We, we uh, found you, or better maybe Toyo, you found us through the Local Love Fund. Mm -hmm. Tell us maybe what United Way funding has meant for Lady Ballers, for some of the participants, especially at this time and this context that you've so vividly laid out. What has it meant for you? For sure. So this funding um, has been really pivotal to helping our organization adapt to online delivery of our programming. Um, a big piece of this transition uh, from in-person to virtual programming is just ensuring that our target uh, population are digitally connected. So thank you to the United Way's uh, Local Love Emergency Fund. We were able to reach out to the most at-risk um, youth populations by providing a number of laptops to uh, Queen Salvation Army Youth Shelter due to our partnership with them. And um, just participants are not able to access online resources because they simply don't have enough computers, right? Um, and another 15 laptops to individual youth in need in our community. Um, when this pandemic struck, we were in the midst of our year-long initiative, Innovate for Change, Building Capacity for Black Youth, um, a program promoting STEM, which is a field with very little um, Black representation, right? Uh, one of the youth actually was the one who suggested running a coding workshop because uh, she had watched an episode on Shark Tank and someone had uh, pitched, <laughs> uh, they'd pitched a coding software where uh, young girls could um, hold one of their dolls riding, riding a scooter or a bike or something like that. And she thought that that was very cool and she wanted to try out coding um, as well. So because of the United Way's generosity, we've been able to uh, purchase these laptops and download different tools and software um, and deliver our coding program to some of the GTA's most underserved youth, um, as well as including them as we continue to develop more resources and tools to better serve them. You, you talked, Toyo, about a teen with insomnia, freaked out about her mom, who's a personal support worker, and having to struggle this digital divide between school and keeping her family up and going. Um, but you're also, through some of this emergency funding, reaching out to individuals facing the pandemic who are still living in shelters. Yeah. Are there any stories um, granular stories that come to mind of lives changed or lives impacted that we've been able to reach to, get to, as a result of this partnership between United Way and Lady Ballers? Yeah, so for sure. Um, so we have youth and shelters that participate in our programming. And um, due to the, you know, the uh, epi the pandemic right now, a lot of them are not allowed to, you know, leave the shelter space. They're not allowed to go outside. They're not allowed to, you know, just um, 
they're not allowed to go out like like many of us but they're also restricted to the spaces that they're in and it just being cramped overall so that's why it was very important that uh, you know when they reached out to us uh, to provide laptops um, that was um, it, definitely like our top priority because we know that just being able to access our programs, access other programs, um, it gives you some kind of freedom, uh, kind of escape. And that's one of the things that we found um, specifically from one of the participants, you know, letting us know like they, they were bored, but they were also like struggling with anxiety because they were cramped in a space and there was, uh, there's just no uh, certainty on what the future is going to look like. And it, it's a very anxious, um, anxiety building time for a lot of um, our participants, um, but especially when you are confined to um, small spaces with a lot of people and you don't really have, you know, the same accesses to, you know, online support. So definitely um, this this um, local love fund was extremely important and so giving them, you know, that kind of freedom just to be able to access programs within their own room or um, not have to um, wait for, you know, a long period of time to access a computer. Um, and yeah, just, um, just in general, it's been an extremely beneficial help for the participants we serve. What, what got you, Toyo, connected to the United Way Fund? Like, you never received funding before. Yeah. Who told you? How'd you hear? What, what the hell made you think, I'm going to apply to the United Way? Uh, this seemingly big uh, but increasingly trying to be local and intimate. How, how did you find out and give you the confidence to say, we got to do this? Yeah, so um, I definitely have an amazing team behind me. Um, uh, I have uh, great people that, you know, are within the sector that um, constantly mentor me on opportunities and where to go for. Um, knowing that our programming was going to be affected and the participants were going to be affected, that was really the time for me to start um, looking towards other resources. Um, some of our um, previous grants and funding had actually been cut um, because we're not able to operate in, in person, but because we're trying to also shift it to online, um, I had to start looking for um, new ways to, um, you know, receive that funding so that we can have our programs still running and adapt into this current times. So it was just, it's just, um, it's just been a blessing in general, just having people that are able to um, encourage me to um, apply to the United Way and then also having the support of the United Way just in general um, saying yes we believe in what you're trying to do and uh, we definitely support you um, in, in, in your endeavors so that has been an amazing help throughout this time. Uh, the, the, ble the blessing is all ours friend for you to be able to reach out to a group most in need um, directly getting support to them. Uh, thank you for finding us. We, I started with this long story about George and George's plea whispered in my ear uh, about working in a United Way. I'm asking now for a Toyo plea. What would your plea be around systemic racism, including anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, a few things that if Toyo served the world, she would say, these are the few things we've got to do together to fight all forms of systemic racism. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, I believe that, first of all, collective action um, is a concrete steps that we need to eradicate anti-Black, anti-Indigenous racism. This will make um, all the difference in uh, how we come out on the other side of this pandemic. We've all seen the groundswell of millions protesting in solidarity globally across the world. It's this type of solidarity, strength in numbers that has made this movement a force to be reckoned with. Um, the key to this collective action is ensuring that the Black community, you know, takes the lead. And more than ever, we need a greater uh, representation of Black leaders across all sectors and um, their voices in decision making across all organizations. Um, I work specifically with youth and um, uh, that population, the education system has to be the center of their of this action as well. You know, um, it, it's key in terms of dismantling systemic barriers. Uh, something is fundamentally wrong when black youth are being victimized and unjustly um, treated in our education systems. Uh, things have to change. And this anti black racism in our schools is essentially it's, it's unconscionable. Um, Education institutions are the, very, are the very environments where young people's self-efficacy can be nurtured uh, uh, when they're encouraged and prepared to reach their, their aspirational dreams. So 
we need school curriculums that involve black history, culture, uh, accomplishments, and not just like one month of the year. We need greater representation, greater black representation um, amongst our teachers, principals, faculty members to benefit both black and non-black youth. Um, everyone needs to see black people in leadership, leadership positions. Um, it's about setting the standard of a more inclusive um, environment, not just um, diversity of thought, but also di actual diversity, right? Um, Lady Ballers Camp, we, we consider education as one of the foundational pillars to advance in black communities, uh, which speaks to our upcoming initiative. Next month, we have Innovate for Change um, scholarship, we've given out a scholarship, and later this fall, our back to school with um, LBC, which is a pathway to supporting learning. Um, our goal is just to help black youth transition into the new school year by providing tutoring, homework, emotional support, just given the setbacks that are facing, uh, they're facing given COVID-19. Um, but finally, I think it's just important for everyone to start calling out racism, you know. Um, no longer would these injustices be tolerated. Racism will no longer be rationalized as um, unconscious bias or micro get, microaggressions, right? This is um, everyone's responsibility and everyone's problem, not just those who are racialized and those who are personally affected. Um, I saw something that said, um, it's not enough to just be uh, not racist, you actually have to be anti-racist, right? right. Um, so right. racism has got to step, um, bystanders, bystanders have got to step in because complacency perpetuates um, and normalizes racism. Such an important concept of allies, but leading from wherever you are, whatever skin you are in, you cannot just stand and watch. You've got to be in solidarity and declare. And, and such an important comment from you, Toyo, and a plea of what needs to happen beyond Lady Ballers and the immediate, which is important, to some of the system change. Thank yes. you so much, Toyo. Thank Hang you. tight. There may be questions and answers for questions for you towards the end. Beth Wilson, Dulcis in Fondo. Um, last year, my friend, you chaired dynamically the United Way campaign. As Andrew mentioned, you rallied over 400,000 people, um, many on this webinar today at our annual general meeting to be part of a United Way, lowercase. What perspectives, what learnings can you share, especially about how we better engage business, donors, hell, just everyday people in our work? Thanks, Daniele, and what a pleasure to, uh, to be here um, and an honor uh, to be on the panel with Minister and, and Toyo. I, I listened very carefully to Toyo's words um, and taking them to heart as I continue to strive to learn myself as a leader. Um, what did we learn last year? You know, I was thinking about it, Daniele, this time last year, right? You and I were meeting in the lobbies of Bay Street Towers. We were pounding the pavement, really engaged in deep listening and learning with our corporate partners. Um, and we're so blessed right across GTA, Peel and, and New York to have such an engaged and focused and generous group of partners. Those leaders and companies that are with us year after year. And we started the campaign, right? Talking about disruption and needing to try a new approach to, to pilot some things and to, and to pivot. And, one of my big reflections is that that loyal corporate base, they were really there with us, right? We, they helped us understand shifting demographics in their organizations and how they were trying to respond to those grassroots movements around philanthropy, trying to align with, with purpose um, from a corporate perspective or target their giving or combine giving um, with opportunities for their employees around meaningful community engagement. And I think we learned from each of those dialogues and then United Way really demonstrated this incredible ability to curate giving opportunities and experiences. I think we also learned um, how to engage uh, those corporate business partners uh, with a great United Way history to help us open doors and start relationships in organizations where we still don't have much presence. Um, you know, on reflection, the rising importance of impact. Um, and I think another great learning for us was to see how open uh, our business partners and donors were to 
uh, giving in a more targeted fashion, but in, in multi-year commitments, which is really important and powerful for the, the United Way. Um, and I think the other thing that I learned really is that when we approach our business partners through the lens of disruption and we explain to them the disruption that was happening to the United Way and how our challenges really paralleled a lot of the disruption they might be experiencing in their own business, whether that is technology or changing forms of competition, uh, they really engaged with us as willing partners to help address and ensure that we had a, a successful campaign. So. For that, I am forever grateful uh, to all of those fabulous partners. Well, and us to you for leading such a charge, but also Beth for opening our eyes and asking at different corporate tables, uh, whether it was bank, manufacturing, public sector, uh, how they were engaging different voices. What were their employee resource groups looking like? Did they have a women's group? Did they have a black group? Did they have a group for their indigenous staff? And how might we collaborate in different ways? And that for us at United Way was an ability to bring in different voices, not only for dollars, but for impact and for hearing what are the lived experiences. And that is a gift you gave us. In addition to a gift of the $1 million Women's Impact Fund. In fact, under your leadership, we surpassed that goal um, in less than a year, driving dollars to programs focused exclusively on women and children and the supports they need, the wraparound supports they need to survive, to work, to thrive. As you look at the context we're in right now and the COVID recovery that we're planning out, as many talk about she recovery, what does that mean to you? And, and why is this lens and approach so important given everything you've seen on the campaign trail. Yeah, you know, Daniele, when we wrote that case for uh, forgiving for the Women's Impact Fund, we talked about a number of things in there, and this was pre-COVID, right? So we talked about women on the front lines of work in our community. We talked about 450,000 women in the GTA living on a low income and their families impacted by that. We talked about women clustered in these low paid and precarious jobs. We talked about racialized women as the only group with university degrees who did not increase their share of secure jobs between 2011 and 2017. And then along comes COVID, right? Which nobody saw coming. So now remove school, remove reliable, safe childcare. Um, think about all of those low paid precarious jobs that were probably the first to be lost, whether on a temporary or permanent basis, and maybe the last to be regained. Uh, large numbers of women working in some of the highest risk roles on our front lines, right? Hospitals, nursing homes, community agencies, uh, grocery stores, all frontline workers. And then layer in the impact of incredible financial pressures in the home, um, data that shows increased alcohol use and abuse, uh, isolation for women in an already violent home, decreased ability to access a safe shelter, and that's just a powder keg for our most vulnerable. So as I look at how this crisis has had uh, incredible disproportionate impact on, on women and racialized women. Um, if we don't ensure that the economic recovery puts women and children at the forefront, I really, really worry that we set women, uh, their families, and frankly, a whole next generation of children back easily a decade. Um, and I see it I see it in our workplaces as well, um, Daniele, dual income households where parents simply cannot cope with two people working remotely, three little kids underfoot with no schooling or childcare, 
um, and an increasing trend uh, for one of those partners to opt out of the workplace. And generally, that still tends to be the woman. And that's coming out of a point of necessity. And we know from studies that that has a lifelong impact on a woman's earning potential and a disproportionate impact on families. So I look at all of those things and, and frankly, I'm very worried about uh, ensuring this recovery puts women at the front. And, and Beth, layer on top of that, this anti-Black, anti-Indigenous racism, this, this additional pandemic that also needs to be addressed and imagine what those layers begin to look like for right. some of our most marginalized. Uh, what, what can, let, let me go back, what can corporate leaders do as we think about anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism? What can corporate leaders do? What is Denton's doing to improve and build equity in their world, in their space to start? Uh, yes, so Daniele, that's a big, that's a big question. Um, and it's such an imperative. And you know, some of the conversations I've been having with corporate leaders as recently as this week, I think many of us are still trying to figure that out. Because clearly, clearly, what we've been doing in our organizations, or collectively in our communities is, is not enough, or it's not the right approach. We don't have the right people at the table. We don't have black and indigenous voices at the table informing what we've been doing. Um, so I don't have a magic answer to your question, but I, I can tell you how we're thinking about it at, at Denton's and we're using a very simple framework with three steps. Uh, the first step is to reaffirm our commitment. So we are looking at our diversity and inclusion statements, our HR processes and policies in consultation with our black employees, our racialized employees. Um, second, we're following basically a listen, learn, and understand protocol. So right now we're creating forums for our Black employees to share their lived experiences uh, with their colleagues and, and with leaders. And then third, we'll reflect on what we've heard and what we've learned, and then we'll collaborate and, and act to take concrete action. Um, but there's no, no doubt we have a lot of work to do inside our own organization. You, just frankly, Toyo called us out on it in terms of looking at leadership and where are the black faces in leadership. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do as corporate leaders um, inside our own organization. But importantly, I think we need to figure out forums where we can come together as corporate leaders around collective action uh, in our communities as well. All, all of us, Beth, I think, have a lot of work to do, uh, not only taking from Toyo's plea, but taking from your comment that clearly uh, we're not doing enough to bring voices, to get voices to the table in positions of power and privilege to be able to move this systemic agenda forward. Now, thank you all. Questions starting to come in from the floor. Please, folks, as you're listening, um, We've, we've started to get questions coming in, still time, webinars at uwgt.org or into the chat line. We'll try to curate them as quickly as we can. I've got a question that's come in uh, on my phone. Just hold for me, folks, as I try to expand this when you get to my age. Question for the minister. Minister, what can government do to address income and health needs of undocumented residents who can't access programs? Thank you very much. I think uh, that's a very good question. And it, it is a question that has uh, a number of, 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 of different approaches uh, to, to, deal with that, uh, to deal with that challenge. One is, first of all, to provide more pathways in our immigration system uh, for permanent residency for, for temporary foreign workers and other uh, folks uh, uh, who have been here for a really long time and who have built a life here, who work, who have families, uh, and, uh, and who overstayed for one reason or another. And, and in the last uh, mandate as immigration minister, I, I did put in a policy that helped, uh, you know, hundreds of, of, of those individuals and, and their families in the greater Toronto area 
who had uh, overstayed their their visas, but uh, were working, were contributing, were had families, and so on. The second one is, as I said, uh, for for temporary foreign workers to have access to permanent residency. The third one is what we're doing with many many community organizations that provide services uh, to everyone without uh, without asking about status. And one of those organizations is in my constituency of York Southwest, and where they provide medical services and attention to everyone, regardless of status. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'm getting um, some buzzes here. So lo and behold, there's a question for Daniele. Look at that, a question for Daniele. How is United Way fighting anti-Black and Indigenous racism? So let me speak on a few issues. Number one, let's, be, let's declare uh, structural racism deeply historical, destructive to our colleagues, neighbors, the very communities that we serve. And so we've got a commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion that's reflected in our decades long work. But in our work, beginning with anti-black racism, decades of research, uh, whether it was through our FACES report in United Way, Peel in the Black Experience Project most recently, both have been catalysts for institutional change. Um, we continue to build on our Black Community Advisory Council in Peel that's been instrumental in tackling some of the systemic racism through its partnerships with institutions such as the school board and police. We've been leading and helping sustain and expand Black leadership and Black-led organizations, whether that's C or Success Beyond Limits uh, or Youth Leaps. In terms of our funding, as I mentioned earlier, uh, close to 90% of our current COVID emergency response investments are reaching out and serving Black and Indigenous community. And we've had that for decades. We're also working on a data for equity project to build on the work done in Peel and bring it into both Toronto and York region to collect disaggregated data, so critical as we heard from the minister and the Black Caucus as well, that we can access and address barriers for equity that is based on data. And of course, we continue to fund a range of anti-racism projects, most recently in partnership with the City of Toronto and Okazi to raise awareness on the persistence of anti-Black racism within our organization. A strong diversity and inclusion team in place since 2009 that's been leading and creating our work around culture, diversity, collective skills. We survey our staff every two years, publish the results to report on the initiatives. And most recently, we published a statement on anti-Black racism across social media posts to not only recognize Juneteenth on June 19th, um, a blog through our Imagine City, but increasingly listening, learning, and leading as we move forward. And let me end that we have a long way to go. Andrew referenced not only our board and committee composition, but our staff composition as well. Steps towards working in a united way that is reflective with multiple voices. That's just one example on the anti-Black racism work that we are doing. Um, and let me continue to look as I get buzzed here for more questions. Um, question for uh, Toyo. What do you think other smaller nonprofits need to be able to continue reaching out to most vulnerable, and what supports might an organization like United Way provide over the long term? Toyo, any thoughts on that? Yes, so um, I would say even like we are a, a pretty small organization as well. So um, I think that um, the work that smaller organizations do uh, is very integral because it's very grassroots and it's very um, to the people, to the communities that um, most, um, need the support and need the resources and need the help 
Um, so I think that um, it's very important that these types of organizations are, you know, um, are funded and our uh, people are supporting them because they're the ones that are really doing the work and they're the ones who have the opportunity to uh, use their parts their participant base and the people that they're serving to uh, inform um, programs and um, resources that are uh, best needed to support them. So at Lady Ballers Camp, we're, we're a pretty small uh, nonprofit organization anyways. And um, I think that um, that's where a lot of our strength comes from. We're able to talk to participants. You know, I lead a lot of the programs. Um, I talk to participants. I develop relationships with them. I'm able to specifically advocate for them and um, use what they tell me um, in our programs to inform, you know, more programs that we're able to do, right? So I believe that um, just that in general, just further encouraging um, more people to be active and more people to develop um, opportunities to support the community is very important. And for organizations like the United Way to um, continuously take chances on them and, um, you know, give them the opportunity to have their vision and have um, what they um, think is best for their own community, um, give them the opportunity to be able to, you know, run those programs and, um, you know, do that work. You know, as I think as transformative, Toyo, as the partnership with United Way has been for Lady Ballers and the group that you work with, I must say that our partnership with organizations like Lady Ballers, uh, small, tiny organizations that we're working with across Peel, Toronto, and York, the Afghan women's group, uh, Roots, a group of small agencies, a third of all of our emergency funding new to United Way. That partnership is transforming us. It's allowing us to get deeper, closer to community unable to do it if it wasn't for the financial support of so many on this call, number one, and the trust that minister and the federal government put in for us to emerge and deal with this COVID reality. My hope is that we take this combo, this commotion of big and small United Way agencies, new United Way partners into a new reality post COVID, deeper connections on the ground where we all know the real issues get solved. We're gonna do a quick 30 second wrap. I told you a little bit about my hope that post COVID United Way stays focused on emotion, motion and commotion, continuing to put dollars out fastest to the most vulnerable. Minister, 30 seconds. What gives you hope? What gives me hope is, is Canadians, uh, how we've come together during this pandemic to help our neighbors, to help our community members, to help the most vulnerable and to be there for our families, for our seniors, for our children. Uh, it, it gives me hope uh, to see organizations like United Way of Greater Toronto Area stepping up like they've never done before, uh, stepping up more than they have done before, I should say, uh, to really help the most vulnerable, to partner with us, and to reach populations that are hard to reach for governments and for the private sector. Thank you for everything that you do, and thank you for your leadership and your partnership with us and with many, many, many community-based organizations that are providing crucial services to the most vulnerable. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Toyo. 30 seconds, give me some hope, friend. Um, I have uh, a tremendous amount of hope for you know, our future right now. Um, just seeing the outpouring of support, the mobilization of uh, uh, protesters, just supporters, um, allies all around the world right now, and just seeing that, um, and hoping that it's just um, not a trend right now and it's more of a movement that generates uh, more and more backing and people uh, all around the world, uh, whether in community spaces or corporate spaces uh, um, and in political spaces are able to um, actually listen to what is being said right now and, and make conscious uh, implementations uh, to their structures and to their um, businesses right now. I'm very hopeful that um, the reports that come out on anti-racism within the school system are then actually used to make real changes and concrete changes that uh, will benefit 
you know, black youth uh, and indigenous youth, racialized youth across um, the country. And just overall, I just, um, just and, and, and hopefully that, you know, organizations like mine and or, uh, other smaller nonprofits are going to be able to continue doing um, the work that we're doing. Um, and we're going to, you know, just all move in towards a place where um, we're all actively working towards um, anti-racism and anti-oppression and things like that. So I'm very hopeful about this future um, based off of these things. We call it civic muscle at United Way, Toyo. The need for a base, a social infrastructure of agencies working on the front line, but then people rolling up their sleeves and getting involved in this place that we love, doing something to make a difference from wherever they stand, that gives us hope too. Beth Wilson, to you, 30 seconds, mm. friend. No, no doubt about it, Daniele, it's the younger generation. So uh, my own boys, the young leaders I've met through um, United Way, Civic Action, the younger professionals at Denton's, they just, they see the issues differently. They activate around them differently. They speak truth to power with courage. Uh, they see different solutions than we do. And I believe they have the power to show us the way to a better and more inclusive future for everybody. That gives me hope. Minister Hussein, Toyo, Beth, you've given us hope. Thank you for your time. Now, Turk friends, it's time for you to do some work, all of you. As you watch a short tribute to our frontline workers, I'm going to ask you what gives you hope Write it on a piece of paper, write it on your hand, write it on your friggin' forehead. I don't care what gives you hope. After this video, we're gonna unmute, show cameras, and I wanna see a wall of hope on this screen. Please, let's play the video. peeps unmute let's see your signs what gives you hope come on put it in the chat room put it up on the screen oh look at that what gives you hope you know what gives me hope all you freaks all you freaks <laughs> friends and family members you give me hope you give united way hope come on let's see some signs local love in action gives hope to Isla McGlynn, welcome Isla. All of you, says Mercedes Watson. No, Dixon Hall and Mercedes give us hope. Dean Rokas, all the way up in New Market Aurora. People give us hope, that's right. Beth Wilson, youth, youth give you hope. Lucy, come on Lucy, what gives you hope, my friend? I see you got a pen in your hand, hurry up, let's go. Community <laughs> gives Carol Kotaka hope. Community, unmute people, you can make some noise, Walid. Say something. What gives people hope? Local love people gives hope. That's together. right. Uh, people Ooh. smiles. Uh, people smiles <laughs> give hope. I know. you, everyone. No. Yeah. So I give you hope. Thank you. So very to give me hope. Together. together. So great to you. So I you. Hey, everyone. Hey, you all. Standing together. Thank you, you so much. Hang in there. Hey, Christina. Hey, Maureen. Hey there. Hey, what gives you hope, Charles? Oh, Beer. Oh, Beer. Come on. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> great work, everyone. Great work. Being together. Great. Way to go. Thank you. Danielle, you give me hope. Wow, well, bless you, yes. my friend. <laughs> You're a little scruff. You're a little scruffy. <laughs> it's a soul patch. It's a soul patch. <laughs> Going into it. war. That's a lot of soul, buddy. I got soul, but I'm not a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> you are a freak. Woo! Oh. <laughs> Thank you folks for Thank joining. You so much.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you for connecting with us. This gives us the hope too. Connecting the people gives us hope too. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and Daniela, a reminder for board members, uh, United Way board yes. members, to please join us on the for the board meeting on the other Zoom line you would have received. Yes. You oh, stay so, on top of everyone, Norman. You're so serious, Norman. He's got to give us all <laughs> the important stuff. He's Just like, when we were stay talking on top about of the business. Oh, <laughs> bless you. We got to go to business now. Oh, <laughs> zest and education. Thank you, fans. Hello, thank Lisa. You. Finally, we get to see you again. Look, and I dressed up for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. You like I'll my dress cottage? Up. I'll dress I'm up. I'm at my cottage. Okay. I'll send friend. you. No, I'll send you the rental info, buddy. Yeah, get up cheers. here. Cheers. <laughs> Have fun, folks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.